Exactly. So why don't you first introduce yourself and tell us who you are and what you do. I'm Nicola Robbie. I'm Rod Robbie's daughter, and I'm a financial advisor. So um, why don't you tell me a little about your recollections of childhood in the Robbie household? The Robbie household was pretty active, although we didn't see my father very much. We saw him at the end of the day. We might see him first thing in the morning, but we were... We were pretty much on our own during the day. And that's not to say he wasn't available, because I do remember walking into his office and having a question. It was an important question, something that was absolutely had to be answered. You'd have to wait while he finished actually writing what he was writing, because he was always writing something. And then you would stand there. And he'd finally put the pen down. You'd ask this penetrating question. You'd get the four-word answer, or sometimes more, and then you'd go away. And it wasn't until many, many years later I thought, actually, I, my parents were completely accessible. I spent pretty much no quality time with my father, and my father was always available to me. And I knew that. Absolutely, I knew that. So what would you say was probably your most, when you think about him as a kid, you know how kids have this ability to sort of no bullshit and sort of say, wow, he's a funny guy or... He makes me laugh, or what was it? What would you think when you were a kid? What were your memories of your father that way, his traits? We had an implicit understanding that what, my, what our parents said to us was not the law, but we had to follow it. We were, we were relatively well-behaved children. Having said that, we also knew that we weren't, um, we were seen and we were heard always. We had the ability to go to them and say what we needed to say, have the answers we needed given back. They would stand up for us. They would go to the mat for us, um, particularly when they felt that school systems or anybody else was not behaving as they should. Um, so I remember having a, having a tiff with my parents about something that I felt wasn't fair. And I walked up and I said, but that's not fair. And that's when I learned that fair and justice were not the same thing. So that would be, it's a, it's a bit of a roundabout way of saying it, but that would be what I would think about most if I thought about both my parents together and, and my father, very much so. So, yeah, I think we've talked about, you know, like there have been, we've talked about the many, with other people today, many accomplishments and stuff, but life wasn't, I'm sure, not always an easy road. Um, the life of an architect. Maybe you could talk about that as a, the daughter of one. In living in a household or living in the family of an architect, certainly an architect who uh, was the type of architect my father was, um, this man believed in design. He believed in doing the job, doing the job to the best of his ability. And certainly others can talk about the specifics of architecture better than I can. But the thing I learned from both of my parents was that you take risks. You take the risk, you take it to its to its very end. And you take it, you do it, you do it in a visceral way. You mortgage your house, which is what he did when he went after the Skydome. I was involved with the Skydome competition, period, with my father, right up until he actually won it. Then I stepped away a bit and then came back later on. But that period was that was the edge of your seat. That was taking it and, and putting it out on the table and playing it out to the very end. But that wasn't the only time we had it happen. My father was, because he was the architect, was subject to a number of suits where they where individuals, for various reasons, went after him. And I remember a very, very clear conversation that we had uh, sitting at the dining room table where my parents explained to us that someone had gone after my father with respect to a suit and that we could lose the house, which means we would have to leave Cornish Road, which certainly for my brother was the only place he'd ever known as a place to live. And it was our home. So risk was probably something I learned very early and in a very real way from living in that family. And it was never anything that we ever shied away from. It was just, it was normal for us to do that. So do you think that, you know, obviously you look at um, the element of risk and you sort of say, uh, when you look at your father's work in a broader scope, you could sort of say, well, you know, do you feel that that's something that he 
was one of his key traits that he would mentor and inspire other people to do the same. I mean, that's a rare, kind of a rare quality, being able to put it all out in the line, not shying away from a, you know, from a battle in that sense. My father's theory of risk was that you take your skill, you take your professionalism, you take your passion, and you bring it to the work. Because if you do those three things, you don't take on undue risk. In my line of work, it's about trying to get what you need without taking on undue risk. He did the same thing. To a lot of people on the outside, he was taking on unbelievable risk. To him, because he had, he knew he knew what to do to get the job done. Now it was to get past the forces that he couldn't control in as, with as little destructive power as possible and, and get to the end of the line, get to the, get to the project. I recall a project he did quite a long time ago. It was in 1981 or 82. It was a secondary school in Mississauga. And he decided that this secondary school, first of all, he went out and won the secondary, he won the competition. He wasn't supposed to have it. He convinced them that he needed to create a, a school that was, that was on a, was on a town plan, going back to some, some very specific roots that he had with respect to town planning. But he decided that the school should have a theater attached to it. And in fact, the Meadowvale Theater in Mississauga is there because my father convinced, I believe, Hazel McCallion to put up the money to build this theater attached to the high school so that the drama students would have a real live theater to go to to do their work when they were learning how to be stagehands and stage managers and that sort of thing. So that was taking the risk, risk of losing the job perhaps, and pushing it to its to its final conclusion. And once again, that goes to you know Rod's belief in that the the buildings that he designed were about the end users. They were about the clients. They were about that that multi-purpose or the programming. Always, the building was an extension of its purpose, and its purpose was an extension of the people who were going to be using it for whatever reason. I had a recent circumstance with my, or recent experience with my father. We went for dinner, and we happened to be having, uh, the dinner was hosted by my goddaughter and her partner. He, through a various numbers of stories, because my father told stories all the time and pretty much became the center of attention in these kinds of dinners, which he didn't set out to do, but he just became. He was describing to these two individuals, to these two young ladies, the reason why religious buildings, in particular cathedrals, large churches, are built the way they are. And as I watched him do that, I realized these two individuals could very easily, he was actually describing a, an Egyptian temple to, I believe, Ra. Anyway, he, as he was doing it, I thought, these two young ladies are going to visit this temple, and they're going to see it now in a light that they had, they had no idea about 20 minutes ago, before he started this description. And it will affect how they look at buildings for the rest of their lives because they will now think, how was the person, what was the person trying to get me to feel as I walked into this space? So I, I think it, his effect had a, is, was, was varied and wide. He didn't talk about architecture to talk about architecture. He talked about architecture because it was an extension of the human experience. So I think, you know, we talked about this and we didn't get this from Angus actually, but we talked about the connection between the Winchester Cathedral and the Sky Dome. You know, and his reference of calling it a secular, secu you know, he thought the Sky Dome was a secular cathedral. So I know that as a child, there is a, you know, a bit in the, in the paperwork, you know, that I read in his book about how that first experience of going into the Winchester Cathedral was for him, like that, that sense of grandeur and light and sort of understanding it all. And this was just at that time period where he was choosing between barber, being a barber shop. The two options that he had were barber shopping. They were like to be a yeah, barber. He was barber or architect. Barber or architect. Yes. And he asked his mom, do architects build bridges? And she said, oh yes, which of course he found out later is probably not true. But that's why he chose architecture. So maybe you could just talk to us about that whole sort of, like you said, like that ex experiential. You were talking about it when you walked into that first room in the church and it was dark. When my father described experience in a building, and I have to say that 
Even today, when I walk into any space, I look immediately around the space. I was taught to do that by my, both my parents. We were, we lived in an extraordinarily visual household. So you, you are, you are taught to look at a space. Now sometimes I also look at things like baseboards and things like that, which are the, the nitty gritty of the building. But going to the experience of the space, he was, he was extremely, um, he was extremely good at explaining how how the designer would take an individual and move them through both an emotional and or a, um, in this case, if we're talking about a cathedral, a religious experience. So in the case of, in this case, a temple, it was, a, it was an Egyptian temple. You came into a very narrow, confined space, very dark. You then moved into the next chamber, whatever that was, and that was set out to give you a specific experience about that god, whoever that happened to be. You were then taken through a further space. And each of these spaces were lit or designed or positioned, it's perhaps not the right word, but were constructed to give you a very specific experience until you came into the final room where the god was created, where it was, was placed or was housed. That experience of going through each of those spaces was something that he had, a, he had an innate ability to explain and, and bring to life, to the point now where I think back to all the cathedrals I went into with my parents, and I think, yeah, we went into those tiny little boxes made out of wood, and then all of a sudden we came into a room. My father started, uh, lived near and studied Winchester Cathedral quite a bit in his youth. I remember going to Winchester Cathedral with, uh, with him and my brother-in-law, and we went and visit the, we were, we were in Winchester for a while, but we visited at the end of the day, right at dusk. And the cathedral was empty, so it was just the three of us. And we were in this space, and I remember coming out of that little anteroom at the front of the building and into this incredible space that was lit very, very, very low because it was dusk. I thought, this is what it was like in the 11th century or the 12th century when this building was completed. And I thought, my God, this place must have been awe-inspiring, overwhelming to somebody who the next biggest building is you know, 15 feet high. So let's talk about your mom and your dad. And what do you know about how they met and how they ended up together? Well, my father and mother, um, my father was a fairly, as I understand it, a fairly introverted guy. Uh, very serious, uh, mostly, mostly because he had to be. He had to, he had to stay in school, he had a scholarship, he had, to, he had to keep his marks up, that sort of thing. But he attended, he was staying in the house, he was between houses for some reason, and he was staying in Bingy Clack's house. And my mother happened to be sort of dating, kind of, kind of not, Bingy Clack. So my mother turned up, knocked on the door, and this fine young man came and answered the door, and she asked for Benji. And she said, where's Benji? I have something for him. He's not here, my father answered very politely. I said, oh, typical. Here, this is for Benji, and handed him a suitcase full of sausage rolls, which were for a party they were having that evening. We go forward. She comes to the party. Dad's at the party, of course. And towards the end of the party, my mother looks around and thinks, Mrs. Clack does not want to come home to a house full of dirty dishes and a bunch of louts who haven't done any work. So she starts collecting up the dishes and goes into the kitchen and starts washing them. Well, my father walks in and starts washing the dishes. We are talking 1950s England. Men did not wash the dishes. She thought this was a keeper. He, I understand, also thought that she's pretty much great too. Well, two weeks later, they had decided they were going to get married. It took them a little longer to do so, but... It, it was a non-starter after that. It, it was just going to happen, no matter what. So that's how they met, over a so suitcase full of sausage rolls. So we cut to them meeting in the kitchen, to becoming new immigrants in Canada. They leave everything that they know, and they come to Canada to the new world. Why do you think they came here? Well, it's interesting that I, when I think about the decisions that brought my parents to Canada, all of the 
all of the platitudes we always hear, economic, better for the family, great place to live, which were all absolutely true. My parents were married in 1952, post-war Britain, and it was grim. It was beyond grim, in fact. A recent document that we happened to find in the family pretty much blew that thought out of the water because we found a document that my mother had written about 18 months after they got here. And she talked about things that they weren't supposed to talk about, the sense of adventure, the desire to do something truly exciting, the desire to go somewhere where they would build something that is brand new, that would take them away from the structures and the strictures of the society in which they had grown up in and allow them to define a brand new life, which, when you think about it, of course, is what every immigrant does when they come to the country. But no one actually ever says that we did it because it seemed like a great idea and it was going to be incredibly fun and we were young enough to do it. So your mother was a painter and um, I always remember the first time I walked into the house and saw the round paintings. And I was like always, I was like, like the city paintings, you know, the city paintings, I was completely taken aback by that. Um, but she had this incredible creative life. And she was, you know, at, at home while your father was out, you know, working a holic. Um, what do you think, like, and yet they had this extraordinary long love affair, this wonderful sort of union. Um, what do you think were the secrets, like the, the two characteristics between the two of them that, that made that work so well? Between my parents, there was a profound respect. There was courtesy. There, there was an amazing complementary set of character traits. My, father, my mother was this incredibly grounded lady. Um, she was both intellectual, she could be extremely earthy, which most people didn't see in her because she was also very proper to the outside world, but she could be very earthy, which I'm sure appealed to my father. Um, but she was also very well, uh, she, she read a lot, she read every newspaper that ever was ever printed in Toronto, as far as I know, and would would almost be my father's clipping service in some ways because he was so so involved with what he had to do day to day that uh, he he counted on her to provide a window to the outside world in some respects. They were each other's best friend, in in again in the most profound sense. My father was never more proud than when my mother became a PhD in history. Um, she was never more proud to know that the process of becoming a, an or, a member or an officer of the Order of Canada had been started. She unfortunately didn't live to see it happen. Um, but I would have to say it was a profound respect, courtesy, and friendship beyond, of course, the love affair, which w was was there. And I I I, per I per personally believe that those are the those are the traits that we as children, their children, have learned and hope to find in any relationship that we have. I always remember also your mother having a great sense of humor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> a wicked wit, I would say in some ways. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> Um, and that there is always, uh, you know, part and parcel of that. Do you think that, you know, that's one of the things, you know, that this, because they seem to have this, whenever I saw them together, there was this flirtatious, I don't know what it was, but I remember seeing it and it was tangible. That there was even, you know, much later on when, we, when I was at, you know, one of the Christmas Eve parties or whatever, but there was always this sort of, she was like a girl and he was like a boy. It was like they got the cat in the cream, you know what I mean? Like I, and I'm not really sure where, where I'm going with this, but I, I thought it was really unique. My parents had very distinct roles in their marriage uh, that they came to by agreement. Uh, at one point, it was thought that my mother would work outside the home, but she decided she didn't want, and, and this was had nothing to do with feminism or anything else, but she decided she wanted to raise her own children. 
Uh, on the other hand, my mother worked ins uh, inside the home for my entire childhood. My mother painted six hours a day from 10 o'clock in the morning to approximately 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And, you know, God love you. If you wanted to talk to her in between, she'd tell you to go away and come back in three hours. But on the other hand, um, they, they had a, they, my father's been described as silly. I wouldn't describe my mother as silly. My mother was not silly. She was, she had a playful element to her. I traveled with them in 1982, and we were in Greece. And my father and I had gone out to get a tablecloth that she had had her eye on, but she wouldn't buy because that was frivolous and she wasn't going to pay for it. So we thought, my father was always doing this sort of thing. He thought, that's it, we're going to go buy it. So we go out. Unbeknownst to us, my mother stays back and has a couple of glasses of wine or three or four, and we're packing to go to our next destination. And she, is, she has been given the job of folding the Kleenexes that my father always had in his pocket. And he wanted them folded in a certain way because it was easy to get, get them out. Well, she got sick of this. And she decided, screw this. I'm just going to fold them all in a big wad and hand them off to my, hand them off. We get there and it's like, excuse me, you're supposed to be folding, excuse me, I'm not folding any more Kleenexes. I mean, it was a silly, it's a silly story, except that it exemplified the fact that, yes, she could be serious. But at the same time, she could say, you know what, to hell with it. Let's just get on with it. The family had a particular adage. We always celebrated interim successes because we never knew whether or not the entire game was going to get won. So we weren't going to miss the celebration on the basis that we didn't look at the one thing that had happened that was right and celebrate that. So I think during Skydome we had a number of different celebrations. Um, certainly we did on, on all the other types of milestone issues that were going on. Um, but celebrating success was, was something that was very important to my parents, whether it be one, you know, my father or any of us for that matter, anything that we were doing along our, along our various paths. So if you were going to talk about, you had quite a, you know, after your mother passed away, you know, you've had quite a like all the other children, but you were exceptionally involved in this sort of day-to-day -day life quite a bit. So what are some of the things, you know, Angus was talking about some of the things that, you know, this journey after Rod's passing has been one of grief, but also of discovery. So what is something maybe that you discovered about your father that you weren't aware of? I wouldn't say there's anything I discovered that I wasn't aware of. We, we had, what we did probably more, a lot more of, was go out and eat. And going out and eating wasn't to go out and have a meal. It was to go out and have a conversation that you happen to be eating during. Mealtime or dinners or going out had to do with talking about an amazing range, just an, a huge range of subject matter. Politics, the state of the world, the state of economic activity between countries, uh, whether or not uh, the plumbing was working in the house. Uh, we People have talked about how my father had a very wide-ranging, uh, how was it referred to, scale creep. Well, absolutely that would happen, but you just wouldn't know what the conversation was going to be. So that's probably what, that's what I will miss, certainly, is having those incredibly freewheeling conversations. Um, with respect to what we used to do a lot together, it was very mundane stuff. My father was a very process-driven guy, so he liked to do things at a certain time. One of them was do his grocery shopping. Then there was, you know, going around and, and towards the very end of uh, end of his life, um, he didn't like to drive all that much. So I used to get in the car and I would go and see him, and we would drive around Toronto doing all the various chores that needed to be done. And then we'd come back and almost always sit down and have a glass of wine. Uh, in my case, sometimes a beer in his case. He did actually drink beer. People tend to think he only ever drank red wine. He didn't. He was, he was an equal opportunity uh, imbiber. Anyway, we would talk about what was going on, what was going on in my life. He was an amazing source of information for me about what my siblings were doing. Because my father, every Sunday, would call around. I would get probably the call. I don't know if I got the earliest call. Sometimes they were pretty early. Um, but he would call to every single one of his children and find out what the state of the nation was, 
what was going on in everybody's life. So I used him in some ways as my information source to find out what other people were doing in my family, what my siblings were doing. Okay, Raleigh. Thank you. Because you did take these legendary family trips. Like there was that mm. trip to, you know, Italy wasn't there. Like, what were the drawings for the Positano house? What was that? The Robbie family never seemed to do anything small. We didn't travel very often. After we'd left uh, from uh, Ottawa, when we'd moved to Toronto, my parents didn't have a lot of extra cash. We didn't want for anything, but there wasn't a lot left over. I think my mother finally revolted in 1970 and decided we needed to do something. It was actually coincidental that my father had to give a speech at the RIBA. So we went traveling. We traveled as a family for a month. We were taken out of school, and we traveled all over England, pretty much. So 1970, 1974, 1976, and then I think it, we had a bit of a hiatus. We traveled in 1995 to Positano. We found Positano because my fifth sister and I happened to watch a film. But one thing that always happened on these trips, my mother was the artist. My parents were sketchers. They would disappear we would be left to our own devices once we were old enough, and they would disappear to go and sketch things. So they would park themselves in a, usually in a cafe with a glass of wine, because you wouldn't want to suffer while you sketched, and they would sketch everything. So they'd sketch street scenes, buildings, not too many people. They tended to stick to, to actual places. But it was a fixture. It was a fixture in our lives in these tri on these trips that we would go to museums. The reason I love art today was I was surrounded by it, but I was taken to look at major buildings. I was taken to look at paintings, sculpture, artwork. Um, again, he could, he could also be, well, we never traveled for any sport, ever. We never went, we went to a beach once, I think, in my entire youth. Uh, but we also traveled back after my mom passed away to see England, see the England my father grew up in. So my brother-in-law, who was fabulous in this, he researched a lot of it. Uh, we, the three of us went, and that was actually the infamous Winchester trip where, where we, we saw the cathedral at dusk in this amazing set of circumstances. But we went to places where he'd grown up. And the thing that we heard over and over and over again, my Lord, this place hasn't changed. My God, this place hasn't changed. He had moved forward. He had come to Canada and forged an entire life that he truly believed would not have happened had he stayed where he was because nothing had changed about the place that he had left. And he found that, he found that completely and utterly surprising and it, it underscored why he left in the first place. So, if you were to, that's, I like that story a lot, but if you were to say what you loved about your dad and what you miss your dad, you know, what you miss about your dad and what you hope, you know, people remember, what would that be? I would, if I have to encapsulate what I will miss about my father, it would be his inclusiveness. He loved, he loved talking to people about what they were doing, what they wanted to do. They had to be careful. If they told him what they wanted to do, they had to be prepared for the fact that he was going to come out with pretty much the grand plan to take them to uh, the presidency of the United States if that was something that they wanted to do and they happened to be American born. Um, so that certainly I will miss. I will miss the grand, the grand scheme of pretty much life, the world. There wasn't a platform that was too small or too large for him to look at and to push to its absolute conclusion. And what do you think he gave you, specifically you? Um... I go back to, my. if I think about what my father gave me, it was the understanding that life is inherently risky and that you absolutely have to step up to the plate and take the risk. 
Uh, the regrets that I have in my life have always been because I did not do that one thing in that I didn't take the risk. And for that, I thank him.